Hi, I'm John Walton. I am professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College and Grad School. Dr. Walton, John, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. My pleasure, David. Always fun to be here. Oh, well, it's good to see you. It's been, a, it's been a while. I'm hoping to get up to Wheaton this fall sometime. Hey, we had a question from somebody that I think lives in Australia, and I wanted to just lay it out and just see see what you had to say about it. The, the fellow wrote, uh, he said, I love the show, and uh, I read Genesis. And I've read it many times. Genesis 1 in particular. Earlier this year, I saw something I hadn't noticed before. In Genesis 1-2, before the six days of creation, darkness and the deep exist. It seems clear that the deep is the seas, and in verse 9, the waters are gathered into one place and the land appears. Now, in Revelation 21-1, and some other verses later, 23-25, to we read there is no more sea and no more night. I've always understood creation to be perfect or near perfect, and yet verse 2 seems to highlight a potential problem, darkness and the sea. That will one day be dealt with, right? Is there anything in the Hebrew of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, or in the cultural context or elsewhere in the Bible that can help us make sense of this? So, John, what say ye on this? What well, do you think? I think that's a great question, and it's something that I actually talk about a lot, and I write about it in some of my, my writings. Uh, the way I approach that is I start by asking the question, what kind of creation account is this? The question that uh, this person has asked mm -hmm. uh, demonstrates that they're thinking in certain forms and certain ways about what kind of creation account this is. And it's, it's a common way for us to think in our modern world. We think of a creation account in material terms. Mm -hmm. What I've tried to demonstrate in my writing is that in Genesis 1 and really in the ancient world as a whole, they're much more interested in God establishing order than in God making materials. Uh, they, they would acknowledge that God made the materials, but that's just not what they want to talk about. To them, it's establishing order, which is the most important part of creation. And that's why Genesis 1-2 begins with non-order. The sea and darkness are the most important aspects of non-order in the ancient world. And by non-order, I'm not talking about something that's evil or flawed or broken. And so I really wouldn't even use the term chaos because it, it might imply some of those things. But it just hasn't been ordered yet. And so the sea and darkness are there. Again, it doesn't talk about God creating them because it's not a material account. And so in that sense, it doesn't pose a, a problem for us. He gathers the seas into one place. The land appears. But you'll notice that Genesis 1 doesn't talk about terraforming mountains and rivers and lakes and right. forests. It, it doesn't do that. It's talking about bringing order. So it's more interested in talking about day and night, time. Hmm. It talks about uh, how we have space in which we live. It talks about the heavenly bodies ruling over hmm. the, the times and seasons. So these are all the ordered cosmos. And so it's that kind of creation account, the way that I would understand it. That also makes a lot of sense when you get to Revelation. And that was an astute observation that we go to, to Revelation because in Revelation, there is no more sea and there is no more night because all of that non-order has now finally been pushed aside. And there is perfect order, total order. That means, as the question observed, that no, Genesis 1 is not creating the perfect state. Genesis 1, when it keeps saying it is good, it is good, it is good, that means it is ordered the way God wants it. It is not totally ordered because sea and darkness are still there. Mm -hmm. And also we know there's an outside the garden which is less ordered than inside the garden. And so in that sense, Contrary to what has been a common way of thinking throughout theological thinking, I don't think that Genesis intends to present it as perfection. It presents it as God has ordered it, and he has made people as his co-regents who are going to be order producers alongside of him to continue bringing order. 
One of the things that sometimes comes up is that when God creates, there is actually a fall of the angels before there is a fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Does the fall of the angels figure into sort of your understanding? Because I know in some traditions it does. No, it doesn't come into mind because it's not supported in Hebrew Bible. Certainly you'll find it in the book of Enoch, so 3rd century B.C., uh, and in some of the other uh, Hellenistic literature from the Second Temple period. Uh, So you can find that tradition there, but I don't see any indication of it in Mm. Hebrew Bible, including places like Isaiah 14. Andrew wrote that he's understood creation to be near perfection, but there seems to be a potential problem. So is darkness and sea a potential problem? Well, I don't see them as problematic. They're just indication that there is still non-order in play. Hmm. In other words, God did not resolve all non-order. He brought order into non-order, but there's still non-order there. And that's, that's why people are recruited, created, in order to continue this process, because it's supposed to be something that we are participating in. Uh, that's one way in which the image of God makes sense, that we are image bearers and therefore order producers along with him. And that's why it gets into subdue and rule. That's part of that order producing activity. The language in, I think it's Genesis 1-2, of tohu wavohu, that is sometimes translated without form and void. How do, how do you understand those two words? Well, I view them in terms of what I call the order spectrum. That is, they are the words for non-order. They're not the words for immaterial, you know, formless already in English sounds like it has to do with materiality. Right, exactly. Void seems to be the absence of materiality. Yeah, okay? yeah. Rather, I think it's the absence of order that is expressed. In the ancient world, interestingly enough, they believed that having a role and a purpose in an ordered system is what constituted existence. So Egyptian texts would talk about the uh, desert as non-existent and the sea as non-existent because they were not places of order and therefore they didn't exist. Their whole definition is different from ours. Ours is material. Right, right. Ours is not. So if you follow that line of thinking, tohu vavohu, is saying it's non-existent Mm. in the order spectrum. Right, right. I've always taken that second word to be, that sometimes translated void, as being uninhabited. In other words, that God is going to populate the sky with birds and the sea with fish and the land with animals and ultimately humans. And so the idea of void, is is, am I off on that? Well, uh, that's logical enough. And that's a fairly common view in the framework hypothesis. It kind of sees that parallel, you know, days one through three are for forming, days four through six are for filling. Um, But again, that assumes these definitions of forming and filling. Right. right. Uh, The word bohu, the second one in the pair, only occurs three times in Hebrew Bible. And every time it's in combination with tohu. And every time it's referring back to this verse. Oh, wow. So it's okay. very yeah. difficult to determine what its specific semantic footprint is. Yeah. Well, it's a great reading, really interesting reading of this. And I hope Andrew appreciates uh, your time and thinking about this. And so, Andrew, uh, let us know if, if, if you have other questions. We're so glad that you wrote in to say hello and that you're listening from Australia. And also that uh, John Walton is somebody that you love to listen to. So he, he says that at the bottom. I didn't want to give you a big head. So he said that very bad. I love John Walton, he said. So at any rate, John, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. My pleasure, David. What a great conversation. I hope you agree. Now, there's only 168 hours until the next podcast drops, so watch for it. Subscribe to this podcast, rate us today. If you want to study biblical languages, you need to consider Wheaton College. They have the best program in the country, bar none. Go to wheaton.edu, look for modern and classical languages, get started today. Come on, you know you want to. Thanks for those who make this podcast possible. John Lonsma is our Wheaton-based director, Ian Rosine and Rebecca Larson. Thanks to Phil Keggy for our music. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>